Bombs! <laughs> you stupid, stucker, toffee-nosed, half-witted, upper-class piles of <laughs> parts! Welcome to episode one of the Faulty Towers podcast, where we're puss-filled and arrogant, but... Not upper-class. Unfortunately not. You say unfortunately, I'm, I'm perfectly pleased. Okay. Inverse snobbery there. <laughs> How are you, Ian? I'm not too bad, Jerry. How are you this week? Brilliant. Looking forward to tackling Faulty Towers. One of my childhood favourites. It's one of the all-time classics, you might say. Oh, without a doubt. I think before we begin, we should refer listeners who want to find out a little bit more about why we're doing this podcast and what we've done before to the introductory podcast episode if you've not already listened. Yeah, it'll probably be labelled episode zero on your timeline if you've subscribed to the podcast. If you haven't, subscribe to the podcast and then it'll be there as episode zero. It's just a short one, gives you a bit of background, tells you about us, especially if you don't know us or you haven't listened to any of our previous shows. Yeah, but more importantly, it will tell you about how we're approaching Faulty Towers from a podcast perspective. Yep. Okay, so with that aside... Episode one. Yeah, will we begin? We should. Do you have a summary, Ian? It's a tradition. Or, let's start a new tradition. Yes. Okay. Crack on. In a touch of class, we make the acquaintance of hotelier Mr. Basil Faulty and his wife Sybil, their employees Polly and Manuel, and a number of visitors to their fine establishment. Basil holds a barely concealed desire to attract a better calibre of guests to Faulty Towers, a goal that his wife considers to make no economic sense nor serve any purpose. When a pair of guests from different rungs of the social ladder arrive on the same day, can Basil treat each with courtesy, or will he rush to judgement? I think we all know the answer to that, Ian. We do. We begin at the reception, where we find Sybil is putting Basil under a bit of pressure with a few tasks, including putting up a picture which she claims has been there for around a week. I quite enjoyed, it opens up with Basil taking a booking for the hotel on the phone and he asks them to confirm by letter yeah. of its time. Very quaint. There are a number of those type of instances in this episode and it is nice looking back. It's quite a long opening scene actually, but it does a really good job, I feel, of introducing at least three of the primary characters yeah. in the show. I mean, I think in fairness, this episode, which we will discuss as we progress through, does a, a very good job of establishing the, the characters, the setting, the, the, the driving factors yeah. for, for each. I mean, it was a pilot episode initially, obviously it's aired as part of the series, mm -hmm. but no doubt it was presented to the, the BBC as a, a pilot, I would imagine. Yeah. The question that I have at this stage, is it just the picture that's new or is the whole hotel new to them? Because it wasn't clear whether, have they just moved in and they're sorting things out the way they want it or have they just bought a new picture? I don't think the hotel is new. It will be interesting to discover if we ever find out how long they've been in the game for. Mm -hmm. Because there is a, a reference to Basil's experience later, quite a negative one. Sure. But I'm not sure, I can't remember if we're ever told exactly how long they have, they've owned the place for. But I don't think they've just moved in. Okay, that's fair. That gives a bit of context then. Because that would be a different source of comedy, wouldn't it? As them trying to figure out what to do. And mm. That's not really how it goes. No, and I think the, I think the fact that they've got some long-term guests means that they've not just moved Yeah, in. of course. Of course, that makes sense. We get our first introduction to Manuel, who is finding it difficult to comprehend that there is too much butter on the trays that he is carrying. Did you like this? Yeah, it's not helped by the fact that Basil's Spanish is terrible. Yeah, I think he's claimed in the past that he can speak Spanish, but certainly not the type that Manuel speaks, well, which he, is Spanish. Yeah, he discusses this with, with Sybil after Manuel leaves. She doesn't like Manuel, obviously, and Basil explains that he hired him because he was cheap and he was keen and willing to learn. But what Sybil doesn't understand is why Basil said that he could speak Spanish during the process. I think the answer to that is that it was because he was cheap. Yeah, he, he lied. To yeah, yeah. The guy. nothing to do with being keen to learn or being yeah. able to speak Spanish. He was affordable. Rather than, than concede that, of course, Basil claims he knows classical Spanish, yeah. which is not a thing. <laughs> At this point, we 
see two of the long-term guests that I mentioned, Miss Tibbs and Gatsby, as they walk past to the dining room. And Basil has been put under more pressure to hang the painting whilst he tries to type up a menu. Yes, that's a bit retro as well, isn't it? Typing up your menu Very in the morning. Very retro, the, yeah. But Sybil's of the view that because that's not needed till lunchtime, he's got plenty of opportunity to hang the painting first. It's an interesting concept, actually. We should probably talk about it at this stage. Time gets a bit compressed sometimes in this episode. It does. I must admit, when taking notes, I wasn't sure if it was lunchtime or dinner time. Yeah, well, without, without there being any cuts, we got a, a scene that runs for about 10 minutes, but mm -hmm. seems to cover four hours. Yeah. Because it goes from breakfast time to lunchtime. Yeah, I mean, I think there, there's not a, a hard cut, but there may well be a, a fade, which is meant to signify that. Maybe. Anyway, Basil's response is, as we're going to find out, fairly typically sarcastic, under his breath and not directly <laughs> challenging to his wife. Yeah. Um... I think he says that that's fine. The guests can look at the picture while they wait for the menu. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't get a chance to put the picture up again, as this time two guests want to check out in a hurry due to Basil forgetting their alarm call. Yeah, this was mentioned right at the start of the scene, and he takes the blame for this. I got the impression these guys, with the live studio audience, if this had been an American sitcom, that these would be two very famous people playing this couple, mm. and they'd have got a huge cheer coming down the stairs. Yeah. I would imagine, just, this is the way it was done. But not in this case. But not in this case, it's too far that I've never seen before. <laughs> and I think um, at this point, in this episode, Basil is certainly presented as being overworked. You know, he's doing the... Yeah, he's doing everything. He's doing everything, yeah. And we see later on Sybil not pulling her weight. Yeah, absolutely. And she's she's very quick to leave. Like mm. She'll come in, say what she wants to say, and then she's gone. You don't mm. get a chance to discuss it with her. No. Anyway, th this couple point out the hurry that they're in and Basil sits down to type up their bill at which point Sybil comes in and questions him as if he's typing the menu again <laughs> but he he's able to pass them the bill and uh, make his way back to the picture yeah after finishing the paper boy he comes in delivers the the news yeah of the residents finishing the, the bill not finishing the picture because that yeah is <laughs> ongoing yes and Basil's quite threatening towards this paper boy who obviously is late compared to what Basil expected mm -hmm. we find out more about the young lad at a later date. Okay. The rushed couple disappear and Sybil explains to Basil that she too is off and she expects the picture to be hanging up when she mm -hmm. gets back. And as you mentioned, under his breath, I think he sarcastically tells her to drive safely. <laughs> <laughs> so we're in the dining room where he greets one of the other permanent residents in Major Gowan and hands over one of the newspapers to him. He apologises for them being late. Yeah, but he is more dismayed by the news of further strikes and at this Basil laments the days when people would work hard for a honest day's pay and put in a decent shift to help out their their fellow man. Ironically people nowadays talk about the 70s when they're saying that. <laughs> yeah but as he's doing this he is snapping at another guest who has the temerity to try and place an order as he's rambling on. I think yes and that guest says they're only staying until Sunday is that presumably less time than they were going to be staying or yeah. does it mean that they're having to wait a long time for their food i'm not sure what the the comment meant yeah no i i took it as that they were only staying until that that date i'm not sure if they'd booked for longer and cut it short or if it was an open-ended booking right. and they had said you know we might stay a little bit longer but it's not a case of we're only staying till sunday so you better hurry up with the food because we've been here for hours well in fairness Ian, that could be how it was meant i've never taken it that way but yeah you, yeah. you might be right no i wasn't sure Basil, anyway, prepares himself a, a small breakfast and takes it through to the office behind the reception. He does, but before we leave, um, we'll come back to it, but the Major talks cricket with Basil. Okay. We'll come back to that, as I say. Yeah. Yeah, so in the office, it's his sanctuary, although it's short-lived. Yeah, we get the first indication that he has a bit of a radar for Sybil approaching. What's that? He's able to hide the breakfast in advance of us realising that she's on her way. So at this point, Basil is certainly played as a, a sympathetic character. Yeah, will be gotten, put upon. Yeah, Downtrodden. Yeah. yeah, but the conversation that follows maybe changes some of that perspective. Yeah, because Sybil storms in to question him about his marketing strategy. What's this? I decided, Sybil, to advertise... How much did it cost? Oh, I have... Fifteen? Forty. Forty? 
I have told you where we advertise. Sybil, I know the hotel business. No, you don't, Basil. Sybil, we've got to try and attract a better class of person. Why? Well, but, but losing tone. You're making money. Yes, yes. Just? Yes, but now we can try and build up a higher class of clientele. Turn away some of that riffraff. So long as they pay their bills, Basil. Is that all that matters to you, Sybil? Money? This advertisement is a waste of 40 pounds. One moment. One moment, please. Well? Well? My dear woman, Sir Richard and Lady Morris arriving this evening for two nights. You see, they saw our advertisement in Country Life. I wish they were staying a week. Well, so do I. Might pay for the ad, then. <laughs> so, well, look, if we can attract this class of customer, I mean, the sky's the limit. Basil, 22 rooms is the limit. <laughs> have, you, have you seen the people in on six? I thought that that scene there nicely packaged up a lot of information for us, especially in this first pilot episode. We found out more about uh -huh. Basil snobbery, Sybil's business acumen perhaps, or Basil's certainly lack of it. And interestingly, in the DVD commentary, John Cleese is critical of this scene. It's the one he doesn't like out of the episode. Really? His view is it was too serious and that you should be wrapping these plot points and jokes to stop the audience losing interest. And Interestingly, that rang a bell for me. You might remember from when we looked at Blackadder on the Blackadder podcast, Richard Curtis said exactly the same thing. Hmm. If you go back to Amy and Amiability, we covered that episode 11 or something, um, he says the exact same thing. It's important to frame your plot points in humour to keep the audience along with it. Um, and Cleese thinks they do a much better job of that going forward than they did in the pilot. Perhaps, but I wouldn't necessarily consider the information as, as, as plot points. You know, it wasn't necessarily to, to drive the plot forward. Yeah, you're, was, but you're setting, up this, you're setting up this scenario where it shows Basil as a social reacher and Sybil as someone who's just concerned with running the hotel. Yeah. But I think, the, I think the social thing is the whole theme of this episode. Sure, but I don't agree that it's purely exposition. There was a couple of, at least two jokes in there, her crack about him not knowing about running a hotel and the 22 bedrooms. So it's not... Okay. But yeah. I, mean, that's, that's okay. I disagree with John Cleese. I mean, what does he know about writing comedy? Eh, uh, okay. Yes. <laughs> In any case, we're back at the reception where the bells went and there is a man. I think he's called Danny Brown. Looking yes. for a room. And he clearly doesn't meet Basil's criteria, either in his appearance or attitude. No, he's got the Cockney accent and the leather jacket and... Long hair. Yeah, and, and to Basil's frustration, a sports car and apparently plenty of money. <laughs> yeah. And after he cracks a joke about getting a, a, a double bed in case he gets lucky that night and noticing Polly, Basil tells him that they have no rooms before Sybil appears to thwart this plan of his. Yeah, Sybil comes through and tries to book Danny in and uh, gives him the check-in card to complete. Yeah, now this is interesting because not only is Basil trying to attract a very specific type of clientele, he's now actively trying to turn down business. So this would suggest that he actually has no idea about how to run a, yeah. a hotel or any type of business. It might just be a momentary thing because he's annoyed about the conversation that he's just had. Who knows? Yeah, this possibly. This guy's rubbed him the wrong way. Yeah, it could be. I mean, in fact, himself, in the, the clip we heard him mention the, the people in number six, so he's obviously yeah. quite happy to take yeah. those sorts if required. Well, we only kind of heard it. It was kind of fading out at the end. I think what he said about them is they look like they've never used a chair before. <laughs> Uh, which again obviously is a bit classist or whatever you want to call it. A bit. <laughs> um, he drops a snobby line here about hoping the arrivals card isn't too complicated for Danny to fill in <laughs> um, before trying to get help from Manuel. Yes, he grudgingly asks him to get Brown's case or cases from his car and after some more communication trouble informs Brown that they're training Manuel and that he is from Barcelona. It's going to be a recurring catchphrase. I don't speak Spanish, but my interpretation of what he was asking is he asked Manuel to put the car in the room, which is why Manuel says it's impossible. Okay. Uh, Basil's further frustrated when it turns out that this uh, slovenly Cockney fellow speaks perfect Spanish. <laughs> and he gives Manuel the, the correct instruction to retrieve the luggage, which he gladly does. He also makes a comment about his Spanish being rusty. <laughs> in the office... Again, trying to de-stress, this time by listening to Bram's third racket. <laughs> he jumps with a start and runs through to try and appear to be putting up the painting when he hears Sybil's return. 
and she agitates him further by reminding him not to forget the menu. <laughs> he can't seem to, it doesn't matter what he does. Yeah, no, whatever he does is wrong. <laughs> but then maybe if he finished a task... That's it. It would be better. Yeah. But it's not his fault, he's had to deal with things. He doesn't seem to be doing much with the painting. I mean, later on he's certainly got a pencil, he's trying to level it out, but... It's, it seems like it should be a much easier task. Yeah. Put a hook on the wall, hang the painting on it. Mm. You mentioned Bram's third rack. I don't think that's technically the title of the piece, but Sybil <laughs> further winds Basil up by telling him that he'd have got it all done if he hadn't spent all his time sitting around listening to that racket. <laughs> We're in the dining room next, where Polly and Brown are flirting as she takes his lunch order. This is where I thought initially it was the uh, it was dinner time, but well, no, it's only lunch. This is where I thought some time must have passed because it was breakfast time in the previous scene, mm -hmm. and this is the first real cut yeah so sometimes seems to have passed although he's having a grapefruit with a bottle of wine yeah <laughs> or that's why i thought it was dinner yeah I mean, of course you can drink wine with with lunch but yeah yeah there's a um little moment here between polly and danny where he goes through the, with the old harassers line of um have you got a smile for me well that's what i'm saying they're flirting with each other because oh. she re responds by Oof, that's a dodgy line at any time dodgy now it wouldn't have been uh, considering what they got up to back then that's not a dodgy <laughs> that's not well, a, the 70s a dodgy line, that's yeah. perfectly pleasant yes. But yes you wouldn't get away with it anymore no well, you, not, you might with some people but you, you'd be opening yourself up to getting slapped in the face if you yeah you shouldn't try it no Polly takes it in good spirits anyway she does well She's professional, that's the problem. This is why sometimes, it's an issue. Sometimes she's professional. Well, this is why it's an issue, because she's not got much of a choice. She has to be nice to the guy. No, but she responds in kind. He'll get a smile if he eats his vegetables. Yeah, okay. Well, she doesn't seem too annoyed by it. No, she wanders off back to the kitchen, and uh, Danny is further antagonising Basil by referring to him as waiter. <laughs> he snaps his fingers, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Garçon. Uh, and asks for their wine list. Basil, rather than hand him the wine list, Summons Manuel to do it. Yeah, sorry, it was Basil who snapped his fingers when he called yes, Manuel. Yes, for Manuel. Um, and there's again a communication block here. <laughs> yeah, which means that uh, Manuel is unable to perform the very basic task of picking up the wine menu from one table and Basil frustratingly has to do it himself and hand it to Manuel so that he can then be handed it yes. himself. I suppose that's how training goes <laughs> But it's all to no avail because Brown knows what he wants. Yeah, and we get a bit of slapstick here because Basil flourishes this menu and knocks a grapefruit to the floor and Manuel polishes the grapefruit and then throws it at another table. <laughs> uh, it's quite nicely done. Yeah, and I think it's the, the wearings table. We, we meet them later on. Okay. Anyway, Basil and Manuel disappear into the kitchen at this point where you hear a, a thump and a yell from <laughs> Manuel. This uh, is the, the first of many physical abuses that yeah. Basil will dish out. I think writers today might be hesitant to write comedy that involves beating up foreign employees. See, this is the thing, and we'll discuss this over the course of the podcast. Basil is not, although I've mentioned him, he does appear a sympathetic character on this episode, but he's not generally meant to be a nice guy. Yeah. So it's fine if you are not portraying him as the hero. I mean, he's the, obviously the, the focal point of the show. Yeah. But even for back then... He wasn't a nice guy. Yeah, he's not meant to be the standard of whatever you want to call no, it. I mean, he's played, yeah. he's played as a, an obnoxious snob. Absolutely. So I think you can get away with him treating people dreadfully. Although I'm not sure if the, 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 these days the, there'd be a lot of humour in that, if you would find it funny. I'll find this funny. But that's because yeah. it's been... It's been you, you're accepting that when it was written and... Yeah. Yeah. Today, I'm not sure if... Yeah, let's smack a, a pole around. No. Yeah. Polly continues her dialogue with Danny a little bit later. She brings out a replacement grapefruit. Yeah, it's at this point he compliments her on one of her sketches. She's left a sketchbook and he's had a look at it and he asks if she's sold any art. And she uh, ruefully says, enough to keep her in waitressing. <laughs> yeah. Basil then returns with the wine, but is again interrupted by Sybil telling him that someone is at the reception. So he angrily storms through. She's at reception. Why is she coming through to tell well, Basil? This is, well, this is one of the times where, yeah, she could have started to, to pull a bit of her own weight, but no. No. So who is there? It's Lord Melbury. But he doesn't know that initially because he is curt and quite rude with him. I think he even takes a call from a, a hopeless builder named O'Reilly who we will discuss. 
I mean, in, in a near future. 20 second phone call, they squeeze in every Irish stereotype. Yeah. Anyway, we'll deal with that more next yeah, think, week. Did they even mention the potato famine in there? He does. <laughs> yes. I mean, however. When he realises this is a lord, he tells O'Reilly on the phone to go away and hangs up. I like, I've always liked that very fast cut. Yeah. The very, the very uh, quick dismissal of O'Reilly to. Well, the, the it's a high point because thereafter he descends into nauseating obsequiousness. Yes. I've actually used that word myself in my <laughs> nose. Obsequiousness? Or yes. Really? Yeah. Right. I didn't even know it was a real word. I had to spell check it. Okay. You do have a, a form of copying my notes, mind you, Ian. Are you sure you... Uh... Okay, no, we'll leave well, that then. He, he does descend into nauseating obsequiousness. Yeah, okay. Let's move on. And this uh, subservience is is very awkward. He even struggles with wheat-based small talk. It's because Manuel's not responding to the bell. Yes, to come and collect his luggage. Ultimately, Basil takes it. On himself. He goes outside, collects the cases, and when he comes back in, uh, Lord Melbury is talking to Sybil. Yeah, she's always more relaxed with guests. She's not always very professional, but she doesn't fawn over them. Melbury's one. Well, Basil tries to introduce them, and Sybil says, We've got it covered, dealt with all this. And Melbury says he wants to deposit a case of valuables. But Sybil's not really interested. She's going off to the kitchen to deal with something else. And Basil can handle this. Yeah, he's happy enough. To, in fact, he's delighted to be given the responsibility. Yes, by a lord although, of the realm yes, as well. Although, did you notice that he immediately leaves them at reception yeah. in full view as he wrestles with Manuel over who should bring the suitcases up to Lord Melbury's room? Yeah, we get another fun sort of physical comedy moment here where Manuel doesn't get the instruction, but when Basil picks up the bags, realises, you know, that's my job. Yeah. But Basil sends him back to the kitchen in shame. We're in the dining room sometime later, where Basil's obsequiousness <laughs> reaches new heights. Obsequiosity. When he decides to move the Waring family, that was the family who received the grapefruit earlier. They're not pleased. No, it's mid-meal, but they have supposedly been seated by Sybil at the table of Lord Melbury. It's his table, he always uses that. So there's a purpose for Basil doing this, It's he's deliberately moving them because one, he wants Melbury to have that nice table, and two, he wants to make out that Mel a lord comes here regularly that's and it. has a regular table. Yeah. So he thinks that's going to give him some kind of kudos in the wearing's eyes as well, because they'll say, "Oh, a lord! Ooh, hmm. what a fine establishment that moves us in the middle of our lunch." Melbury enters, but the cap doffing Basil makes a mess of things by pulling out his chair just at the wrong moment, and. He takes a tumble, much to the delight of the Wearings. <laughs> I think Mr. Wearing says, I think he's killed him. <laughs> yeah, he's delighted at it. For, yeah, for no, yeah, yes, he, he smells as he says that. Then I think Manuel takes a slap as yeah, Basil tries to blame him. Basil just thumps Manuel for no reason. They're just like, well, no, something's think, gone wrong. Yeah, I'm going to blame him. Mm, yeah, I think it's that. I think that's his natural his natural reaction. But I also think it is an attempt to shift the blame. Because Melbury wouldn't necessarily... No, no who, yeah. A little later at the reception, Melbury approaches an overly apologetic Basil and he graciously dismisses the earlier incident. He does, however, have a request. Your Lordship, <laughs> would you allow me to offer you dinner here tonight as our guest? Oh, that's extremely kind of you. Unfortunately, I have an engagement tonight. Oh, oh actually, yes. uh, there is one thing. Mm, good, good. Um, I was wondering, uh, can you cash me a small check? Uh, I'm playing golf this oh, afternoon. Oh, delighted! Uh, yeah, I'd rather not go into the tower. Absolutely! I mean, uh, how much? Uh, if it's not a rude question. Uh, yeah, no, well, uh, could you manage, um, fifty? Oh, a yeah, hundred? Oh! <laughs> Absolutely! Oh, yes, I mean, uh, will a hundred be enough? I mean, a hundred and fifty? Two hundred? A hundred and sixty? Or... Oh, yeah, well, now, let's see, it's dinner tonight, few tips. Oh, and it's the weekend, isn't it? Ah. Would 200 be all right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, please! Oh, tremendous! Oh, I'm so happy! Oh, I'll send someone down to the town straight away and have it for you here uh, when you get back. Yes, well, that'll be splendid. Yeah. Well, thank you, thank you a lot. Thank you so much. No, not at all. I mean, my, my privilege. There's a deep conflict in Basil here because on the one hand he doesn't want to give away this kind of money, probably barely has that amount of money and is terrified of losing that kind of money. But on the other hand, 
he is deeply impressed by a man who could spend that kind of money, who doesn't really think anything of asking for that kind of cash. And right after that clip, Basil, when uh, Melbury goes away, Basil says to himself, what breeding? <laughs> yes. It's a great clip. Oh, I'm so happy. I like that. <laughs> I'm going to adopt that as my new catchphrase. Yeah. You can see him justifying it to himself, convincing himself, yeah, no, re or reassuring himself that it's, yeah. uh, it's fine, this is how these sort of people and therefore how we should behave and act. Yeah, absolutely. However, he is not so keen to tell Sybil what he has agreed to do and tries to distract her with a kiss. That's like my favourite moment in the episode. He gives her a kiss and she says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm kissing you, dear. And she says, well, don't. <laughs> Before she brings up the lunch incident, which he attempts to shrug off in the, the same way that Melbury did. Yeah, there's a sort of interesting bit here where Sybil's realised that Melbury's cases aren't that nice. They're a bit tatty. Mm -hmm. And Basil, not being able to explain that, takes one of, it's one of these things that you see it a lot these days in politics discussions and especially with certain politicians where their supporters will support anything they do because it must be right because they've done it. Mm -hmm. So Basil says that these tatty cases are only the upper class would have tatty cases like this and it's the whole point. Yeah. Without really knowing what point is yeah, he making. I, I agree that that's why he's doing it. However, I do accept what he's saying. A lot of the time people with money don't necessarily or people who have it's it's not they're not the nouveau riche. So they don't feel the need to show it off. The difference is when people earn the money or make the money and haven't came from money, you want to show off so you get the designer luggage or the, the cars, clothes, whatever it is. But so people, that makes this a plausible explanation, but in this circumstance, it's not the correct explanation. Yeah, yes. Yeah, so I'm saying I agree with what you're saying, but also I yeah. accept what Basil's saying. I think that someone who has a lot of money, like a, a Lord Melbury, may well have tatty old cases because they don't feel the need to buy the, the designer luggage. Sure. Sybil gives him a strict and red line warning, I think, at this stage, never to move a guest during their meal again and reminds him to hang the picture. Under his breath, can you remember how he responds? Oh, I can't remember. There's so many good ones. What Calls her a sour old rat. Yeah. <laughs> Just then, Polly comes through and Basil tells her to go to the bank and get the £200. But he does tell her to keep it quiet from Sybil. Yeah. And I think this is a... A recurring theme as well. Basil been up to things that he has to be a little bit more covert about. Yeah, I think one of my... I, I don't know if I can say favourite things, but something I like about this, is that a decision that they made with this is to not have any sexual tension between Polly and Basil mm. during the series. I think that would have been an easy thing to do mm -hmm. and it's better without it. Definitely. Say that at this point. Yeah. We're in the street now at the bank where we see Polly coming out and she notices Brown in a car watching a jeweller's with another man beside him. So there's no dialogue in this scene, but we see that he asks her into the car and they have a talk and they watch a, a furtive Melbury exit a jeweller's and he is then followed by another acquaintance of Brown. I mean, I think it's obvious at this point that he's a, a, a yeah. cop. There's no dialogue in this scene. There's the theme tune is playing mm -hmm. underneath, which makes you think, about the lack of background music in the other scenes. Mm, yeah. There's not really any at all. Which is good. Yeah. But it's, some shows have that. But yeah. this one, it has the music in this scene, but not in the hotel scenes. Mm -hmm. Back to the reception. And whilst again trying to put the picture up, he is disturbed by the phone. And with only Manuel around, he has to answer it himself doesn't do a good job of that either. They appear to have two lines. And Sybil has picked up the one that is ringing. At this point, Polly enters and is quite agitated. She wants to speak with Basil urgently in the office, but he's far too busy and runs through to the bar area where he serves the major before the, the wearing family enter for their refreshments. Yeah, Sybil points, to, points out to Basil to 6pm. So obviously some time has passed while Polly was in town. Um... So that's good. That gives us a frame of reference for where we are in the day. Polly, we should say, also gives Basil the money before he goes through to the bar. Yes. In the bar. Did you like uh, Mr. Waring here? He's quite sarcastic. I like Mr. Waring generally. Yeah. I thought he was very good. What does he do? He orders a gin and orange, a lemon squash and a scotch and water. Mm -hmm. Then there's a 
a hilariously humorless exchange about whether there's any parts of them they shouldn't be sitting in. <laughs> and um, Basil says no, go and sit down. But before he can pour their drinks, Lord Melbury enters. Yes. Wearing, I think, is probably named from the fact that his patience is wearing thin. Yeah. And he... But it wouldn't have been... Uh, Melbury comes in. He double checks ag again. Yeah, and then, but he also yes, he, he doesn't respect the fact that Melbury and Basil are talking. He interjects a couple mm. of times, I think, with first of all confirming he can sit where he wants, and then secondly repeating his order a wee bit later on. Quite right. But Basil's not interested. He just wants to show Melbury a good time and offers him a free aperitif. Yes, and he accepts that. He takes a, a dry sherry, I think, which Basil is. <laughs> <laughs> completely unsurprised by because that is what the upper classes drink at that time of day yeah Sybil comes through for no apparent reason mm -hmm. and Basil comes out from behind the bar to go and talk to Melbury yes who is inspecting his coin collection and I think we see Polly watch on at this point yeah when she sees Basil hand the cash to Melbury she runs out to signal the police yeah Brown and his partner are in a car in a car park and he flashes his lights at her to acknowledge that he's mm -hmm. seen her. Back in the bar, Waring is still waiting on his drinks order when Melbury suggests that he take Basil's collection to the Duke of Buckley, who is an expert on coins, so that he can have it valued for insurance yeah, purposes. I think he says he's got connections at Sotheby's or he's worked at Sotheby's. Um, probably not worked as a, a lord, but he certainly has connections at Sotheby's. And Basil's almost overwhelmed by this. Well, I mean, that pushes all the buttons for Basil. Yeah. At this point, Mr. Waring once again repeats his order slowly yeah. and loudly. I see another incident of Sybil not pulling her weight. So yeah. she tells Basil that the Waring's haven't been served yet, rather than serving them yeah. herself. She's just hovering around at the end of the bar. I don't understand. No. At this point, the bell goes in reception. It's Polly. And Basil goes through to speak to her. Yeah, she asks him to go through to the office for a, a discreet chat, which he reluctantly agrees to. Well, you say reluctantly, I think he agrees to it because the alternative is going through to her Sybil shouting on him. <laughs> yeah. He doesn't want to do that. So he <laughs> tells her he's doing something important and speaks to Polly. In any case, she tells him that Melbury is not a lord, but in fact a con man, and explains that Brown is a CID and that him and his colleagues are going to arrest Melbury when he leaves the hotel. And they've done this to make sure that Basil is not embarrassed in his own, yeah. his own place. So Basil, is... having assessed their character already, knows that Brown is just saying this to get into Polly's bed mm. and that she'll find out soon enough what his real motive is. However, Sybil appears in the office and after snapping at Basil, listens to Polly and ignoring his protestations, opens the briefcase and what does she find? Bricks. This appears to push Basil to the edge and he, he twitches and he taps the bricks in his head, he has a little listen. I think that's a quite a nice performance here. But before he can get a chance to fully break down, the bell goes again at the reception. And it is who? It's Sir Richard and Lady Morris. It is. I think they're the ones who booked from the Country Life magazine. Indeed. The Basil is still distracted and is in fact a little bit suspicious. He knows he's been been burned here. I don't know if he's suspicious so much as just he's not with it at all. Mm. Because when they say who they are, he's like, how do you know they're coming? And then he realises that's who it is. But he doesn't react to them the way that he reacted to Lord Melbury. So something's changed. Oh, certainly, yeah. However, he is refocused when Melbury arrives in the scene. Ah, Forty. Mr Forty to you, Lord Melbury. I beg your pardon? Oh, nothing, please. Forget all about it. Ah, well, here's the um, check for £200. Ah, oh, uh, thank you so much. <laughs> and now, about my priceless collection of coins. Oh, yes, do you still... Do I still want you to take them to be valued by the Duke of Buckley, my lord? Oh, yes. Uh, no, I don't. Because we just heard that the Duke of Buckley is dead. <laughs> yes, got his head knocked off by a golf ball. <laughs> Tragic. <laughs> Tragic. Well, how are you, Lord Melbury? How are you, then? All right, mate. How's me old mucker? Any valuables to deposit, Sir Richard? Any bricks? Oh. Or... I do apologise. You bastard! <laughs> I'm sure you were 12, but if you overlook in the park, I'm sure you'll like it. We'll have your bags brought up to you. Oh, and may I introduce your wife? Hello, Lord Melbury. <laughs> bastard! 
The Morrises are not very impressed by Basil's apparent breakdown and treatment of another guest. <laughs> yes, obviously having no insight out into what's happened. And just at the end of that clip, what follows is a chase around the hotel with um, Melbury eventually being captured, I think, with the help of yeah. Manuel. Well, Polly knocks him down with a table and then Manuel finishes him off with a chair and the police pile in, at which point Basil comes over, kicks him in the stomach, I believe, and takes the money back. And at this, I think he's quite he's happy enough, but Sybil tells him that the Morrises have left and despite running after them, they leave in a hurry. I think we heard that at the top of the podcast in the clip. Yeah, there's a, a wee continuity thing. Basil's hair tidies itself up when he goes outside and remesses when he comes back in. Okay. But anyway. Um, when, uh, yeah, and the way back in, he's denied a final swing. Yes, the police won't let him have another Pop. go at Melbourne. But when he gets back inside, Basil makes certain to thank both Polly and Manuel, which is an interesting side Yeah, well, character. just before that, Brown apologises to... Yeah, well, he's on his way through the door, yeah, Brown uh, apologises, he's not interested. He's not at all, no. But he does, as you say, which was a, a nice touch. And I think this might be one of the few, if only, times where he's actually said thank you and he, you believe it's heartfelt. Yeah, I think you certainly do, though, because he's... Mm. He seems at this point quite a, a beaten man. Yeah, his um, world view has been shattered. Mm -hmm. We can discuss it through the, the run of the, the podcast, but I, I'm not sure if that ever you get that, that, that sense again. Mm. Brown comes back in, offers to buy Basil a drink, but mm. he's not interested. He's got to put his picture up on the wall. But as he tries to do this for the final time, what <laughs> happens? Waring comes through and possibly the best delivery of the entire episode uh, repeats his order once again, which sends Basil finally to the edge. Yeah, he smashes the picture and storms through. He frog marches Waring to his table <laughs> and then I think he just puts the bottle of scotch and the bottle of gin down and tells him to deal with it himself as the credits roll. I think it was a nice way to tie up the episode. All the loose ends were, were put in their place. Ah oh, yeah, it was good. Well, there we have it. Enjoyable start. A very good start and I think of the other episodes hold up as well as this one, we're in for a, a treat. I read some things that said the show wasn't that warmly received initially and the BBC weren't that keen on it at mm. the pilot stage but I find that surprising. Although I suppose that maybe it was radically different from what had come before. Yeah. A lot more farce mm. in these episodes is a lot more, or in this episode and more I don't, I don't know if the word, the word's cringe, but there's like this, it's um, challenging viewing at times if you're of a nervous disposition. <laughs> yes, in this episode and and more so in episodes to follow, it's the, the, the type of show where you think, oh, just say this or just do that and you can sort everything yeah. out. Don't do this. Yeah, so that would challenge audiences that weren't used to that sort of comedy, mm -hmm. I would say, which maybe explains why it took a while to catch on. Yeah, it's also very manic. Not quite as, I mean, if you're coming as a, a fan of John Cleese from, from Monty Python, then you might be expecting things that are a little bit more cerebral or, maybe that's not the right word, but a bit more, a surreal. bit surreal. Yeah. Yeah. But, I, yeah. I think, I, think they, they made, I think the BBC made the right decision in, in the end, <laughs> going with it. You mentioned earlier this was the pilot. Now, I think yeah. this was filmed perhaps several months before it was Eight aired. months before the rest of the series was filmed and even longer before it was aired. And you can tell, I think there's some things, the credits are different mm. in this episode than we're going to see in the future. Uh, but unlike a lot of other shows, almost nothing was changed. I think there's a couple of bits um, with Polly and Danny in the dining room. Mm -hmm. Those two conversations were redone later. Yeah, I think that initially she was a philosophy student. Yes, and they didn't like that part, so they changed her to an art student in those uh -huh. two chats, so they brought back in um, Robin Ellis and did those those two conversations. But really that was all that was changed between the original filmed pilot and what was broadcast. Okay. As is tradition with us, we'll run through some production information and any trivia we might have. Any other trivia we might have. Okay. <laughs> So it was first broadcast on the 19th of September 1975, a long time ago now. The producer and uncredited director was a Mr John Howard Davis. He died in 2011, aged 72. He produced and directed The Complete Season 1. He has also been involved with Mr Bean, The Good Life, Monty Python, Steptoe and Son and The Goodies. 
amongst other things. And he was the head of BBC comedy from 1977 until 1982. Powerful man. It's noted in Prunella Scales' biography that he's the one that brought her in for the role of Sybil. Mm, good choice. John Cleese and Connie Booth were the co-writers. We'll discuss them in a future episode. Reasonable. Michael Gwynn played Lord Melbury. He sadly died in 1976, aged just 59 and four months after this episode aired. He also appeared in Poldark, Village of the Damned, Spy Trap, Zed Cars, Cleopatra, The Queen Street Gang, Poison Island and also Great Expectations. He was six foot four. Uh -huh. We'll get back to that. Okay. Danny Brown was played by Robin Ellis and you might recognise him even today. Born in 1942, he starred as the original Paul Dark in the 70s Paul Dark and he's also, I believe, in the remake that uh, ran recently. Oh, they didn't turn her show. Yeah, it's still going. Is it? Okay. He has also starred in Cluedo, Capstick's Law, The Waterfall, The Moonstone and The Inside Man. He's the older brother of the late director Peter Ellis. He directed uh, in America The New Adventures of Superman, Smallville, NCIS, The Highlander TV show, Sliders and, and Matlock, <laughs> <laughs> amongst other things. And Robin is also the brother of actor Jack Ellis, who had many appearances in both Coronation Street and one of your favourites, Bad Girls. Yeah, from back in the day. I didn't ever consider Robin Ellis to be a, a tall chap, but he is six foot three. And I think that the reason that he was picked perhaps and uh, Michael Gwynn at six four were to not be overshadowed too much by John Cleese, who himself is about six foot five. Yeah, big people. Yeah. I think Ellis went to university with Cleese. Okay. It might have led to this. Mm. Who knows? Um, I know that he's now doing cookbooks and he has an active blog, which we'll link to in the show notes. Is he on Twitter? Yes. Get in touch. <laughs> Terence Connolly played Mr. Waring. He died in 2016, aged 96. A good innings, as they say. Just short of his triple Nin digits. 97th. Yeah. <laughs> This is the first of two episodes. Yeah. He also appeared in The Fall and Rise of Reginald Perrin, The Bill, Monty Python and Delta Team. I think he was more of a character actor. He had a very long CV. Many of the parts uncredited, however. <laughs> That's really unfortunate. And finally, for this week, Ballard Berkeley played the Major, Major Gowan. He died in 1988, aged 83, and appeared in every episode of Faulty Towers. He was also in The Crime of the Century, Leave It to Todd Hunter, The Common Room, Swizzlewick, United, The Newcomers, Dixon of Doc Green, The Dick Emery Show, National Lampoon's European Vacation, <laughs> Fresh Fields, and his last appearance was a voice appearance in the BFG, the 80s version. Okay. Do you have any other trivia for us, Ian? Will you... Teased us earlier on with a mention of cricket. Are you saving that for a later episode or have you got something to say? Oh yeah, okay. So the Major mentioned Basil D'Oliveira. Now he died in 2011, aged 80. He was a, a mixed race England international with South African background and he played in the 1968 tour of South Africa. It was obviously apartheid at that time. Yeah. And with him being mixed race and coming from South Africa or having South African heritage, um, they didn't want him to play. But I think it had a, a major impact in terms of sport and apartheid and uh, publicising what was going on. So it was a, a fairly big uh, situation. But he was a, a, a obviously a, a top class player. His son was also a professional player and so is his grandson who himself plays for the same club. His name's Brett and he currently plays for Worcestershire. There you go. Sticking on the, the cricket theme, it was apparently a thing during filming that uh, Ballard and Cleese would um, share their, a love for cricket mm. and quite often apparently Cleese would uh, be filming a scene and uh, Ballard would be off camera but holding up fingers for how many wickets had gone down in a game and things mm. like that. So that was a connection between the two of them. Sure. When redubbed for a Spanish audience, Manuel became Italian. 
And when you watch it on uh, Netflix, it says one use of discriminatory language. <laughs> I'm not sure which particular phrase it was. I know in the next episode which oh, one yeah. is the objective. I didn't catch the one in this one. Did you have a, a favourite line or scene from this week's episode? There's a few. I did. I really liked the bit where Sybil told him not to kiss her. Mm. Um, but I also like Mr. Waring's final order. Yeah, good choices. I would have to go for Basil trying to be very casual and delighted at offering the, the, the check cashing service. Yeah. I thought it was an interesting decision to have Basil recover the money. Mm -hmm. So that takes away the tragedy side of it. It takes away some of the pity. Yeah. We'll probably note every week the opening sign, which is generally an anagram of something else. But this week it was just uh, Faulty Towers with the S hanging off. It was also wider and in a different front from how we will see it going forward. Mm, there you go. Next week, and it will be next week, not in two weeks' time. Why would it be in two weeks' time? Because our previous two podcasts were bi-weekly. Okay. Uh, is the episode entitled The Builders? We'll get to that uh, in yeah. seven days' time. How can people get in touch and help the podcast? Okay, so if we want to chat with us, social media is the best place to go. We're at Faulty Podcast, spelled the way you'd expect, on both Twitter and on Facebook. So get in touch with us there. Happy to have a word, have a word with any of you. If you want to comment on the episode, probably the best place is at FaultyTowersPodcast.com. There's a thread up for each of our episodes which match up with the Faulty Towers episodes of the same name and you should be able to get involved there if you want. One big thing that would help us an awful lot if you have the time, even if you don't, um, could you please, please leave us reviews on iTunes, preferably good reviews with on iTunes. Five stars. Yes, even <laughs> if you hate it, just put five stars and then say I hate it because that helps more people find the show and the more people that find the show the better the conversations are going to be and the more interaction we're going to have and the more fun it'll be for everybody okay well that's us first episode done so until next time cheerio bye bye